There's the man, the myth, legend. Hello, Dr. Ward. How you doing, William? You doing good, sir? Oh, man, I am supersized fabulous on a beautiful Friday. Greetings from South Carolina Medicaid. Thank you, sir. I hope you're doing well. Uh, better than I deserve, sir. It's always a pleasure to see you and hear you. Thank you, buddy. We'll get going in just one minute. Hey, would it be okay if I said hello to Dr. Ward? Sure, go ahead, Paul. How you doing? I am Wayne? doing great. How are you, sir? Good. I've got my uh, my work life organized enough to spend an hour with you. So I hope you're doing well. <laughs> yeah, we're doing well. I'm trying to stay home and stay out of trouble. Oh yeah, I recognize your office there. <laughs> <laughs> My museum. <laughs> well, sure, sure. Well, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll just be here watching and listening. I don't know if I'll have any questions for you, but well, but that's I'm, not a problem. You have a great day. Good to hear from you, Paul. Yeah. Yes. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us uh, here on our uh, Pharmacy Fridays uh, and Happy Pharmacist Month. We are excited to have this special new drug update on our Pharmacy Friday with someone who needs no introduction. That's Dr. Wayne Wirt. Uh, the goal of We Are MUSC Pharmacy campaign is to celebrate the unity, the impact, and the potential of the collective MUSC Pharmacy family. Individually, we represent thousands of different backgrounds, experiences, specialties, passions, and interests but together we are MUSC Pharmacy. Our American Pharmacist Month campaign uh, advocates for the profession, highlights the achievements of the MUSC family, including our faculty, staff, alumni, donors, students, and friends of the college. Wayne is certainly one member of the MUSC Pharmacy family who certainly we know needs no introduction. He has received virtually every pharmacy award South Carolina has to offer, along with many national recognitions. And his new drug update has become an institution on its own. Before I pass it off to the man of the hour, I would like uh, to make a few virtual housekeeping notes. We have over a hundred of you joining us today. Thank you, that's wonderful. Uh, but we would ask you to remain muted uh, and utilize the chat function. Uh, we have uh, a poll for assessment purposes. Uh, the code will be part of the poll and will be distributed via the chat function at that time uh, for those participating in the live Zoom meeting. A reminder to anyone watching on the YouTube live stream, uh, either live or the recording uh, is not approved uh, for CPE. With that, Dr. Wirt, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dean Hall, and thank you to Megan Draper for helping put this thing together. So do I just need to hit share screen? Do you guys know? <laughs> if I do? I yep. can do that for you. Yes. Aha. Uh -huh. oh, let me and do this, I hope. There we are. So hopefully everybody can see and hear me. And we're going to uh, go through an abbreviated new drug update today. And I don't have any disclosures. I haven't spoken for industry in over 10 years. And I haven't served on any industry advisory boards for at least that amount of time. So hopefully nothing to disclose. I want to start off with a brief review of some stuff with COVID-19. And this is a uh, quote from our uh, infectious disease fellow that most people like, uh, maybe not our president, but uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci. And Dr. Fauci has been around for a long time. And he says that about 40 to 45% of our infections with COVID-19 are asymptomatic. So we wouldn't have any symptoms. And the problem is that these people can still spread the disease. And it's now clear, he says, that 40 to 45% make it difficult then for us to do 
surveillance to see who we need to pay attention to. He also said, and this is a quote that I've linked here, a sense of normalcy is not likely before the middle of next year. So we're going to have to continue where we are for the next at least six months. And Lou Kaplan, president of the SCCM, told Medscape, this really supports universal wearing of masks and the capstone message, you should protect one another. We have to protect each other. And the best way to do that is wearing a mask and practicing social distancing. Somebody have a question or comment? Can you hear me? Somebody's talking in the background. This is an interesting study that just came out in the last couple of weeks from the Kaiser Family Foundation. And what it looks at is what's happened this year to the major things that people are concerned about for the upcoming presidential election in the next uh, two weeks. And back in February, healthcare was number one, the economy was number two. You see climate change, foreign policy, national security, immigration, those were the top five issues. We didn't have coronavirus. In May, coronavirus came along and we had a crash in the economy. So the economy jumped up to number one, healthcare dropped to number two, and coronavirus outbreak came up to number three at 17%. Well, the most recent version in September, just last month, the economy is still number one, even more concerning. Coronavirus is now number two. Criminal justice and policing is number three. Race relations, number four. And healthcare is now down to number five. So it's been a huge change this year in what is concerning most of us as potential registered voters that we want to think about for the upcoming election. And I'm not going to go any further than that. Don't need to go there and get politically involved. But it's a significant change in what concern is. And coronavirus has jumped up dramatically now based on where we are in the last six to eight months. And this is a terrible slide, but it shows very nicely what happens if we cough or we yell or we sing, we spread droplets, and that's where the virus is. So this is why we have six feet of social distancing as a minimum, and that's without wearing a mask. And if we wear a mask, you can see you drop those droplets down significantly, and if both parties are wearing a mask, the risk goes down even more. And there are two studies from MMWR, the CDC here on the right. And one is a man who flew from China to Toronto back earlier this year. He subsequently tested positive for COVID-19. He had a dry cough, but he wore a mask on the flight from China to Toronto. All the 25 people close to him, around him on the flight, everyone tested negative for COVID-19 because he wore his mask on the flight. And the other one is a study that came out of the state of Washington or out of uh, Missouri for two hairstylists who both turned up positive with COVID-19. And they had contact with 140 clients while they were both positive for COVID-19. But everyone wore a mask. They wore a mask, their clients wore a mask, and nobody who they exposed to in their salon became positive for COVID-19. So these just go to show again how important it is to wear that mask and appropriate wearing a mask, not below your nose and it's not a, uh, an eye patch, those kind of things. This is another one that's a major concern. This is a new study that CDC did and it initially looks at data from New York State New York was the highest in the United States and they dropped off dramatically. And it also shows what happened in Spain and Madrid. Earlier in the year, there was a huge spike. It went back down. And when Spain reopened their restaurants and allowed indoor dining, it spiked again even higher than the original ones. So this is a survey that was published in MNWR back in September. And I want to show you, I've highlighted here restaurants. And these are closing uh, community and close contact exposures with COVID-19 positive symptomatic adults 18 and over. And 
the greatest risk of getting COVID-19 that is statistically significant, a p-value of 0 0.001, is going to a restaurant. Restaurants increase your risk of getting COVID-19 because you can't eat with your mask on. And most people, if you're having a conversation while you're eating, you are actually spreading, potentially spreading the virus again. So this is another concern that Dr. Fauci had. So Dr. Fauci was actually on Good Morning America here in the last couple of weeks, back the end of September. And he said that Governor Ron DeSantis of Florida, Governor Henry McMaster of South Carolina, both had recently announced plans to lift COVID-19 restrictions on bars and restaurants. And most bars and restaurants had limited capacity to 25 to 50%. Well, as of last couple of weeks, both Florida and South Carolina did away with that limitation. It's now back to 100% capacity. So this is what Fauci said. This is very concerning to me. We have always said this is something we really need to be careful about. Because when you're dealing with a community spread, you have that kind of congregate setting where people get together, particularly without masks, you're asking for trouble. And I believe that's one of the reasons we're seeing a, our third spike. And I'll show you some data on that. But we're in the middle of a third spike for COVID-19 right now. This is today's data from the Johns Hopkins Coronavirus Resource Center. This is the worldwide map. Globally, almost 42 million cases of COVID-19. The United States is still number one. We have over almost eight and a half million cases in the United States. And on the right-hand side, you have global deaths. One, over 1.1 million deaths, United States is also number one by far in deaths, over 223,000 deaths as of today. And these down this yellow bar graph at the bottom is the worldwide daily cases. And you can see we're shooting back up to where we have almost a half million cases a day in the world. So we are shooting up dramatically right now. These numbers are going up every two days by a million cases over here as far as global cases. So we are in the midst of our third peak with COVID-19 and we haven't gotten cold weather yet. So this is very, very concerning and it is not a good sign. This is also from the Kaiser Family Foundation earlier this week. This is a report that suggests COVID-19 in the United States is the third leading cause of death this year. It's behind heart disease, number one, cancer, number two. It's ahead of accidents. It's ahead of respiratory disease. It's greater than stroke. It's greater than death due to dementia. COVID-19 ranks fourth as a cause of death in France, Sweden, the UK, but in Germany and Australia, it's 17th and 18th respectively. So the United States has the highest cause of death from COVID-19 of any country in the world right now. So we are not doing a very good job is what this tells me. We are not social distancing. We're not wearing masks. A lot of places out in town even here in Charleston, where we have still have an ordinance where we should wear a mask, it's not happening. A couple of other things just briefly to review with you. This again comes from the CDC and some autopsy studies earlier this year. The most common causes of death due to COVID-19 are pneumonia and pulmonary embolism. So it's respiratory distress, pneumonia, and clotting disorders, including pulmonary embolism. So we've got respiratory, inflammation, and clotting. So this is a study data that's out of the journal Chest earlier this year that looks at a retrospective review of over 2,700 patients hospitalized with COVID-19. 28% received systemic anticoagulation when they were admitted. And there was a significant improvement in hospital survival in intubated patients if they got low molecular heparin as compared to no anticoagulation. 
71% basically survived versus 37% who were not anticoagulated. So it's about a 50% difference in outcome. So you significantly increase hospital survival if you treat these folks with prophylactic doses of low molecular weight heparin, and that's what this guideline recommends. Vaccines, this is a hot, hot topic right now. Three of these vaccines that I've highlighted with the blue arrows on the uh, left-hand side, the one by Oxford University is being co-developed by AstraZeneca. MUSC is a site for this one. So this vaccine was uh, started in clinical trials phase three. You also have Moderna's, which is in phase three, and Pfizer BioNTech. All three of these are in phase three trials right now. And all three are part of Operation Warp Speed that the federal government has started to fund. So these companies have all been paid large sums of money to go ahead and produce vaccines ahead of time, even though they have not been approved or even emergency use authorization by the FDA. So that once they are approved for either approval or emergency use authorization, there will be vaccine already available so they can start getting it out. So these are the three that are closest but there are well over 180 different vaccines under development worldwide. These are the big three in the United States as far as the operation work speed. But we also have data from Johnson & Johnson and several others, Novavax, that are in the process of cranking up phase three trials. So lots more even in the US. So one of the things that AstraZeneca announced back in September, they did a pause on their trial in the UK because they had one of their patients who had a neurologic event, unexplained uh, change in cessation, limb weakness, and it considered that it might be related to the vaccine, so they stopped it. Their drug safety monitoring board reviewed it. They decided that it was not a major concern with the vaccine, so the UK started their study back up again for that vaccine. In the United States, the FDA is still waiting to get all the information. They have not allowed it to restart to my knowledge here in the US, but it has restarted in the rest of the world. So stay tuned, we'll probably see that restart in the US as well. Same thing happened with Johnson & Johnson's vaccine on October the 12th. They had a study participant. We don't know what happened. They haven't given us any information but it caused a pause in their 60,000 patient study, and hopefully it will be restarted. And again, it's a pause, not a clinical hold, and it's one case, and we don't know what happened yet. So stay tuned. Pfizer and Moderna's vaccines are still underway. They have not been paused or stopped. We hope that we will have data by the end of November for two months of safety data after the doses of the vaccine. So that's what we're planning on. And initially we had hoped that be some data submitted after two months. Well, yesterday the FDA had an advisory committee meeting and they're concerned if we allow emergency use authorization based on two months of safety data, that may put the companies who submit and get an emergency use authorization at risk for not getting full approval on a vaccine because it may skew the data. So we don't know what's gonna happen right now. It's still a very much up in the air decision if we'll see an early emergency use authorization by the FDA or not. That's a controversy. And one of the reasons it's a controversy is this second bullet point by Kaiser Family Foundation. They've done a national survey 54% of Americans said they would not get a COVID-19 vaccine if one was approved before the November election and was made available free to all who wanted it because we're concerned about what do we know about safety and efficacy yet? Can we know safety and efficacy after only two months when people have received the vaccine? That's a huge concern. And that's one of the things the FDA talked about at the advisory committee meeting yesterday. So how soon will we see it? 
Moderna and Pfizer are the two that are closest to submitting. Both could submit by the end of November or early December because they've all committed to at least two months of safety data to submit it to the FDA. And Pfizer, BioNTech, and Moderna both have completed enrollment of their trials as of the last week or two, which means that they could potentially submit within the end of November or early December to the FDA if it's two months. So nobody knows yet. So we'll see what's going to happen. Pfizer and AstraZeneca J&J &J, are using rolling admissions or rolling review in Europe for the European Union with their data there. So we'll wait and see what happens. We don't really know yet. So that's where we are with the vaccines. At best, maybe we'll see a vaccine by early to mid 2021. I don't expect we're gonna see a vaccine before then that's gonna be FDA approved. And if it is, it'll only be an emergency use authorization and it will only be available to high risk people. So right now your nursing home folks, your people who are immunocompromised, your people who have heart disease, diabetes, lung disease, cancer, those kind of folks would be your high risk group. Your first responders, your healthcare providers, your teachers would be in that high, high benefit group. So with limited supply, it would be targeted those highest risk folks to make it available for them first. It would not be made widely available to everybody until those folks had a chance to get it first. So have to wait and see what's going to happen. A couple of things that we also now have, we've seen used in clinical trials and emergency use authorization. Convalescent plasma, where you take somebody who's had COVID-19, they've recovered, they developed antibodies, you take their plasma and you take convalescent plasma to harvest their antibodies that they've made and then give it as an infusion to people who have not developed antibodies yet. So this is the infectious disease side of America's statement on convalescent plasma as of September the 4th. Recommendation, patients who have been admitted to the hospital with COVID-19, the infectious disease side of America guideline panel recommends COVID-19 convalescent plasma only in the context of a clinical trial. So let me show you a clinical trial that we just got today. So this is new as of today. This was published online October the 22nd, yesterday by uh, the folks from India, the Placid trial. And this is 464 adults from India hospitalized with COVID-19. They either got convalescent plasma, 200 milliliters for two doses, 24 hours apart, plus the best available care versus best available care only. And their primary outcome was progression to severe disease based on PO2 levels, O2 levels, and mortality at 28 days post-enrollment. And what they found is severe disease or all-cause mortality was 19% in the intervention group, 18% in the control arm. There was no difference at all. So they said convalescent plasma was not associated with the reduction in progression of severe COVID-19 or all-cause mortality. British Medical Journal yesterday. Dr. Ward, this is Megan. I'm advancing your slides, and I think um, some of the ones that are hidden are showing up. Could you tell me what slide you're not on? Oh, wait a minute. Because I was advancing them, and because I, I added some, some, and I hit a whole bunch of them from me. Okay. Well, would you like me to stop sharing, and you can just share yours from now on? That would be great if you can. All right, I'm gonna stop right now. Okay, <laughs> I'm sorry. Another, no, that's fine. I was keeping up with you there for a little bit, but I think some of them were hidden. Um, you're, yeah, I didn't have enough time to do everything. <laughs> so I'm on monoclonal antibodies, number slide number 35. Okay, do you wanna just share yes, yours? Yes, I now? will do mine then, as long as it, it works that way. I thought that's what I was doing. All right, you're now oh, the host. Now I gotta come back and 
go to it, but I'll get it. There we go. So I think we're right here. So monoclonal antibodies, this got real good attention when President Trump was hospitalized because he got IV monoclonal antibodies investigationally before these were approved. And neither one of these is FDA approved. There are two in clinical trials, one by Regeneron and the other one by Eli Lilly. And what these are are monoclonal antibodies that target the spike protein of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So both of these are under clinical trial right now. So the first one, the one that President Trump got was the one by Regeneron. It's an investigational cocktail that's got two different monoclonal antibodies targeting the COVID-19 spike protein. It's a one-time infusion of eight grams. The high dose is what our president got. There's also a low dose versus placebo or standard of care. And the drug has not yet been approved and it doesn't even have an emergency use authorization by the FDA. It's only in the in clinical trial right now. Okay, Dr. Ward, I'm sorry, this is Megan again. So yeah. um, we you haven't shared your screen yet, so we aren't able to see your slides. Uh, let, me, let me escape and see where I am with sharing, because I thought that's what I was doing. You come to my Zoom, share screen, screen. Here. Can you see it now? All right, we got it. I think. So. Can everybody see that? We good? I can see I it can on my see. end. I can see it. Okay, good job. All right, I'm sorry. <laughs> so basically, what we have is that patients who are seronegative negative or higher baseline viral load appear to have greater benefits based on preliminary data from these studies. So this is the one that our president got. He also got zinc, vitamin D, famotidine, melatonin, aspirin, according to his physician. So they gave him the, everything in the kitchen sink uh, and luckily he did well. Lilly also has one and their trial is called Active 3 and it's also a phase three trial with monoclonal antibodies. And basically the Data Safety Monitoring Board recommended a hold because they had uh, some different clinical status in those who got the drug investigation versus those who didn't. And it's on a clinical, uh, basically pause, not a hold. So again, while the Data Safety Monitoring Board reviews it. so. We'll see what happens, but they have two other trials underway that weren't paused. So lots of stuff going on with these, but these are two promising things, but we don't know what's going to happen with them yet. Here is the uh, recommendation from the IDSA on remdesivir. This was just approved by the FDA yesterday. So this now is FDA approved. And their recommendations are on hospitalized patients with severe disease, who have PO2s less than 94% on room air, or they're on supplemental oxygen, they're on mechanical ventilation, intubated, or on ECMO, they recommend the drug over no antiviral treatment. And they say it's conditional recommendation, moderate certainty of evidence. If they're on supplemental oxygen, but not ventilator on ECMO, they also suggest five days rather than 10 days of redemsphere. Red and if they've got O2 sats greater than 94%, they recommend against the routine use of the drug. So those are the three recommendations for the ID Society of America currently for remdesivir. But this was also published this week. This is the World Health Organization solidarity trial with remdesivir. 405 hospitals in 30 countries, over 11,000 patients. 2,700 got remdesivir. There are a whole bunch of different regimens in the solidarity trial, but about 2,500 uh, folks got it. And if you look at the graph here, remdesivir versus its control, those curves are exactly superimposable. 
there is no difference in mortality in the solidarity trial with remdesivir versus placebo or control, none whatsoever. And if you look here, none of these are significant either. None of the age groups, ventilated or not ventilated, and overall, no difference. So again, there's a slight benefit, but not much. That's the solidarity data. Well, Dr. Paul Sachs, who's a contributing editor of New England Journal, Journal Watch on Infectious Disease, pediatric ID specialist, he put together an editorial that came along with this solidarity trial. And this meta-analysis is one that he, he found. And the only trial that shows a benefit is the one done here in the US, sponsored by Gilead and NIH. And it does show, it was published in October in New England Journal of Medicine, shows a benefit of 42% relative risk reduction when it comes to mechanically ventilated patients. And the weighting in this meta-analysis is about 23% because it's about 1,000 patients. Solidarity is 2,700. And these are even smaller up here. So don't know where this is going to go, but this suggests no benefit in, in the solidarity trial, but a benefit in the active trial. So Gilead announced yesterday it was approved by the FDA. And here is the data that the New England Journal published back in October, this earlier this month. It's 1,062 patients U.S., and it did improve time to recovery in the five-day population, so significant reduction in the number of days to recover, less likely to need oxygen support at baseline, significantly lower risk of ventilation needing emergency ventilation or ECMO, and it also reduced mortality by about 3.5%. So this shows everything beneficial and this is what the FDA based their approval on yesterday, this trial from New England Journal back in October. And here are the side effects they found. Nausea, about 5%. Increase AST and increase ALT, 2 to 3%. And they do recommend you need to monitor hepatic function before and during therapy. And if it goes above 10 times your upper limit of normal as far as ALT, they recommend stopping it or if they have any signs of liver inflammation, stopping the drug. And you can't use the drug if you have renal function, EGFR less than 30. These are in the label for the new FDA approved drug. Here's a recommendation for hydroxychloroquine by the Infectious Disease Society of America. And basically they recommend against hydroxychloroquine, strong recommendation, moderate certainty of evidence. They also recommend against hydroxychloroquine in combination with azithromycin. Strong recommendation, low certainty of evidence. So hydroxychloroquine hopefully has been put on the back burner and the FDA withdrew its emergency use authorization for the drug. Other treatments, high dose famotidine. This is based on data from China and there's an ongoing study in New York City suggesting it might be beneficial but the IDSA said hospitalized patients with severe disease against famotidine unless it's in the context of a clinical trial. So don't really have outcome data yet. This is the one that's got the best data for mortality. Dexamethasone, and this data comes from the UK recovery trial. This was back in June of this year. Hospitalized patients, six milligrams of dexamethasone, once a day for up to 10 days versus usual care. The primary outcome was mortality at 28 days and 21.6% died at 28 days by 28 days with the dexamethasone, 24.6% with the uh, placebo, a 3% absolute risk reduction, 17% uh, relative risk reduction, and my number to treat is 33. So for every 33 patients with dexamethasone, but again, these are hospitalized patients, not ambulatory patients. So it reduced deaths by one third, 
reduced the need for invasive mechanical ventilation significantly, reduce the need for oxygen therapy, and conclusion, hospitalized patients reduced mortality, especially those with invasive mechanical ventilation or oxygen and randomization, but not among patients not receiving respiratory support. So only those who needed oxygen or ventilation assistance were benefited in the UK recovery trial with dexamethasone. So here's the IDSA's recommendation. And again, hospitalized patients critically ill recommends dexamethasone rather than no dexamethasone, strong recommendation, moderate certainty of evidence. And if you've got a shortage of dexamethasone, can be IV or oral, you can substitute methylprednisolone 32 milligrams a day or prednisone 40 milligrams a day. So that's in the guidelines. Hospitalized patients with severe but not critical COVID, they also suggest using dexamethasone. Non-severe patients without requiring supplemental oxygen suggest against the use of glucocorticoids. Conditional recommendation, low certainty of evidence. So only those who need respiratory support or oxygen in the guidelines. So that's kind of an update on where we are with the new stuff on COVID-19. Quickly, a couple of new things that just happened this summer with flu vaccines for this year. And these were from the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, changes for this current flu season versus previous. So one is we have two new flu vaccines on the market since last year. We have flu zone high dose quadrivalent. What we had in the past was trivalent, it's now quadrivalent, but because it's got a fourth component and it's four times more concentrated than regular vaccine, the volume is increased. It was 0.5 mils per dose. It's now 0.7 for this one. So it's got a higher volume because it's got four uh, different antigens and four times the concentration of regular flu zone. So that's a change and they will do away with the trivalent. We also have Fluad quadrivalent by Sequeris this year for 65 and older that has the adjuvant. So that's also quadrivalent this year. So both those vaccines are quadrivalent. They're both only approved for people 65 and older, but they're not preferred in the CDC guidelines. They're optional. You could use any flu vaccine except the nasal flu vaccine for people 65 and older. But we do have data. They're more immunogenic than the regular flu vaccines. And we have a study at least with the trivalent flu zone high dose that it shows it's about 24 to 25% more effective than the regular flu zone. Same components, but the higher concentration increases efficacy in those 65 and older. And that study shows a number needed to treat of about 214 patients. So every 200 plus patients who get high dose, one less documented case of influenza due to a strain in the vaccine is what they showed. Another change is, we've always said, if you use the nasal flu vaccine, you've got to be careful because if you treat somebody within 48 hours before you give the nasal flu vaccine or up to two weeks afterward with one of the oral antiviral drugs, that the nasal flu vaccine will not work because it has to replicate in the upper airways to be effective. Well, we now have a couple of new drugs, Permavir, which is IV, and Biloxivir, oral single dose, that have much longer half-lives than Oseltamivir, Tamiblu, and Zanamivir, Relenza. So this still holds 40 hours before, two weeks after flu mist for Tamiflu and Relenza, but for Permavir and Biloxivir, it's now been changed dramatically. So it's up to five days before for Permavir, the IV, and for Biloxivir, 17 days before you get flu zone that you'd have to still worry about flu zone not working because Biloxivir stays in the body for several weeks. So that's why this is a change in the labeling. This is new this year. 
and one other, they changed the contraindications for LAIV, used to be conditions for which it was not recommended. It's now a contraindication, asplenia, cochlear implants, and active CSF or cerebral spinal fluid leaks. So those are now listed as contraindications instead of rather uh, conditions where it's not recommended. They've also had a change in the labeling as far as egg allergy. We now have two vaccines, cell culture based, flu cell vax that's quadrivalent and recombinant flu block that's quadrivalent. Neither one is made in eggs. So those are now both recommended. If you need to treat somebody with one of these vac uh, vaccines who has egg allergy, you can use these and not have to be in a setting where you're prepared to treat anaphylaxis. If you're gonna use any of the other vaccines, it's still the way it was labeled. Have it done in a place in the office or a practice that is prepared to treat anaphylaxis should it if it occur. And it says it does not hold with these two egg-free vaccines, flu cell vax and flu block. So those are the changes by the advisory committee immunization practices from the CDC back in June of this year. I'm gonna switch gears and talk a little bit about some things with cholesterol. And back in September of 2018, we had the publication and presentation of the REDUCE IT trial with icosapentethyl EPA VASIPA which is fish oil, but it's EPA only. And these are a large number of folks, over 8,000 folks, 70% had a history of coronary disease on a statin and either given Vasipa four grams a day, EPA only, or placebo and followed for 4.9 years, looking for cardiac events. And to qualify in this trial, their LDLs had to be controlled on a statin. So the median baseline LDL was controlled within the 70s. It was between 40 and 100, but their triglycerides had to still be elevated above 150. So 150 to 499 in spite of a stat. So that's the subset that we're looking at in this trial, the REDUCE-IT trial. And here's what happened for the composite five-point maze. Cardiovascular death, heart attack, stroke, revascularization, or unstable angina. 25% relative risk reduction, absolute risk reduction of about 5%, number needed to treat right around 20. And you can see the curve separated after a year and continue to get further apart over time. So that's the primary composite endpoint. Here's the individual components. And every component except total mortality is statistically significant. So every outcome is in the right direction. Remember, both groups are on statins. Both groups have LDLs that are controlled. Both groups have elevated triglycerides. One gets Vasipa, the other gets placebo. So the ADA took this and put it in their guidelines March of last year. They suggest based on this data, patients who have elevated triglycerides on a statin should consider adding EPA only or Vasipa to their therapy. And the FDA approved it December the 13th of last year for a new indication to reduce the risk of coronary events in people who are on statins but still have triglycerides above 150 milligram per deciliter. They also suggest there was a slight increased risk in atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, and bleeding. Remember, omega-3 fatty acids, fish oil, inhibit platelet aggregation and can cause bleeding. So there were higher risk of bleeding. There was a higher rate of atrial fibrillation. And if you're allergic to shellfish or fish, you don't want to use the drug because it's a fish oil derivative. The other thing we have is we had a study that just was stopped earlier this year in January called the STRENGTH trial. The STRENGTH trial was using a different omega-3 fatty acid, Epinova, by AstraZeneca, which is a combination of EPA plus DHA, which is regular fish oil, if you will. But it's the prescription one that AstraZeneca was trying to get on the market. And it was their cardiovascular outcome trial. And you had to have statins, controlled LDL, and elevated triglycerides again. 
but this study was stopped due to futility. There was no reduction in cardiac events using the combination EPA plus DHA in patients very much like the reducer trial. Dr. Steve Nissen, who shared this study from Cleveland Clinic, past president of American College of Cardiology said, the trial will now be closed in an orderly fashion and full data will be presented at a forthcoming medical meeting. That hasn't happened to my knowledge yet, but the preliminary data was no benefit, it was stopped for futility. And we now know based on analysis from Merton College of Cardiology in March, EPA is the part that works. DHA is not beneficial for these patients. So it looks like it has to be EPA. And the good news for those of us who want to recommend EPA, we may not have to use VASIPA because they just lost a battle in the courts that allowed generic EPA to be marketed. So stay tuned, we should have some generic EPAs sometime in the next year. Next thing quickly, bepidoic acid, next Latel, tall. This is by Experion Therapeutics. It was approved in February. It's a new class of drug to lower cholesterol. It targets LDL. It's a different receptor, a different part of the system that's blocked in cholesterol synthesis in the body and it's additive to your statin. So this one is a first in class. It's called adenosine triphosphate citrate inhibitor, and it lowers LDL, but it does not have any cardiovascular outcome data to date. It was approved by the FDA in February. Their cardiovascular outcome trial called the CLEAR cardiovascular outcome trial is underway. And hopefully we'll know, but it's got 14,000 patients enrolled as of last August that have high cardiovascular risk in 1,400 sites in lots of different countries. So most of these patients are considered statin averse. So this is not in combination with the statin in this trial, and that may be a concern. Lots of warnings and precautions. Lots of things they found in the trials with this drug. Hyperuricemia, increase in uric acid. About 26% of patients versus nine and half percent with placebo. If they have a history of gout, increased risk of gout, one and a half percent over the short-term trials versus 0.4 with placebo. So about three to four times greater risk of gout. If they had a history of gout, it's over 10%. Tendon rupture, like quinolones can cause tendon rupture. This has been reported to cause tendon rupture. It's small numbers yet, but tendon rupture has been reported. And especially if they're on steroids, they're older, they have renal failure, previous tendon ruptures, all those are red flags. So discontinue immediately if you have uh, experienced pain, swelling, inflammation that's related to a tendon. BPH for your males with benign prosthetic hyperplasia, 1.3% of treated patients versus 0.1% with placebo, greater than tenfold increased risk. AFib is increased. Increased creatinine and BUN. Small numbers, but it's still in the wrong direction. All those are within the label of these drugs as precautions, things to watch for. Drug interactions. Simvastatin, you double the blood levels, so they don't want you to use it with simvastatin doses greater than 40. Pravastatin doubles your blood levels. Don't use greater than 40 milligrams. Torvastatin, resuvastatin, Ezenimab, no dosage adjustment. Here's some data that they used to get it approved. 52-week, one-year trial on maximally tolerated lipid-lowering therapy. So the mean LDL at baseline was 103. 50% were on high-intensity statin. And the difference between this drug and placebo added to a statin was an 18% reduction in LDL. So it lowered 18% lower LDL. HDL went down by 6%, so it didn't raise HDL to good cholesterol, it lowered it. And it also had minimal effect on triglycerides in the wrong direction. So it didn't, didn't really help much with triglycerides and it hurt HDL. The dose is 180 milligrams, early once a day with or without food. And the cost is about 13 to $14 a day or $400 a month. And it doesn't have any outcome data yet. 
It also has no data comparing it to a PCSK9 added to a statin. And I'll share what happens when you add it to a statin because that's also a proved fixed combination now. So this is a combination with bepidoic acid and ezetimab zetia. Next, Lizette. So this is 300 patients with severe dyslipidemia and they compare zetia, ezetimab to this drug to the combination to placebo. So you've got all those different arms. And the mean baseline LDL in these patients who are at high risk is about 150. 65% are on statins and 35% on high intensity statins. The LDL reduction was 36% adding the combination bepidoic acid plus Zetia, 17% with bepidoic acid by itself, 23% with Zetia by itself, and 2% wrong direction with placebo. So it's about half the effect of what you see with the combination, and it's not quite as good as uh, Zetia by itself. But Dr. we have Burke, this combination. Yes. Could I just give you your five-minute warning? Yes. Thank you. Last thing I want to share with you are the new asthma guidelines. This is the GNAC guidelines from last April. And what we're going to see is we don't want to use Saba only for rescue. Albuterol, leave albuterol by itself, is no longer recommended as a rescue inhaler for patients with asthma unless they're also on a steroid. By itself, they're no longer recommended. And I'm going to show you why. This was the old guideline in 2018, still had albuterol as your preferred treatment for rescue. You get beta receptor down regulation with albuterol, decreased bronchoprotection, increased hyperresponsiveness, and decreased bronchodilated response, and increase in allergic reactions, eosinophils, and inflammation with regular use of Saba by itself, albuterol by itself. And if you use more than three canisters a year, you increase your risk of hospital and ER visits. Greater than 12 canisters a year, you increase your risk of death with asthma with albuterol or leave albuterol. Here's some data that was published a couple of years ago, Medicaid and commercial. The Medicaid database, the adults are in red, the blue are kids. What you see here is the odds ratio to predict asthma-related outcomes, and that is hospitalizations or ER visits, and as the number of canisters across the bottom goes from one to greater than six, they both trend up. And in the commercial data, it's even higher. So there's an increased risk of hospitalization ER visits, the more canisters of albuterol you use as rescue therapy by itself. So they no longer want to do that unless you're on an ICS. So they well recommend patients with asthma should receive symptom-driven or regular low-dose ICS controlling treatment to reduce the risk of serious exacerbations. So basically the new guideline, and this is the for adults and children, low-dose ICS whenever a SABA is taken. So if you're on albuterol, leave albuterol, you need to take a dose of your inhaled corticosteroid at the same time, or look what they put first, as needed low dose ics famotorol The asterisk is it's off label. This is Simbacort. That's what's been studied. The combination of basically bunesonide plus famotorol. Famotorol is a long acting beta agonist, but it's fast onset. You'll note it doesn't say salmeterol. It's not the Advair. It's not Air Duo, because salmeterol is slow onset, long acting. Fomoterol is fast onset, long acting. So they are now recommending for these patients, preferred is using Simbacort for rescue, PRN, as needed. It's off label. It's not approved in the US. It is in Europe, but not here. Or if you're going to use albuterol, you need to take a dose of your inhaled steroid every time you use your albuterol, the combination. And that has a greater benefit to reduce 
bad outcomes. Now, if you're already on, for example, Advair, the combination of salmeterol, flutigazone, don't use Simbacort as your rescue. You can still use albuterol as your rescue if you're on any maintenance that has an ICS in it. You don't want to use two long-acting beta agonists together. And that's what this update in November of last year from the GINA guidelines suggested. Don't add a second long-acting beta agonist. If you're on a long-acting beta agonist, you can still use, with your steroid, you can still use albuterol as your rescue. If you're on Simbacort, it can be used for maintenance and rescue. So the only long-acting beta agonist combination they recommend for maintenance and rescue together would be Simbacort. And basically it shows a 64% reduction in severe exacerbations if you do that. So that's, that's the data. These slides are from the GINA guidelines. They're not mine. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to you guys for the questions. Cause I think uh, Megan has a poll already, right? I do, and I'm gonna launch the poll now. And there are five questions and on the sixth slide is the code. And then Dr. Hall will add the, has added the code into the chat as well. Great. So Dr. Wirt, we do have one question um, coming from Whitney. And that is, I have a question. Uh, I'm, I work in nursing homes and admissions, has a policy that a patient admitted from the hospital and was treated for influenza must have finished their last dose of Tamiflu uh, at least 24 hours prior to admission to the nursing home. Is there any information on the time frame uh, for how long someone is contagious after receiving a single dose of Biloxivir? Did I say it? Yeah, sure. Biloxivir? No, but we know it stays around for over a week in the body. So it's a single dose therapy, but the problem is it's gonna stay around for even longer than that. And that's why you can't give the, the live nasal flu vaccine, but we have no data. If they've been treated, hopefully within 24 to 48 hours, hopefully they would be culture negative, not shedding the virus, but we don't have that information that I've seen. Yeah. Hey, Go ahead. We still have people taking the poll, but if there's any other questions, we can take those. All right. But uh, Dr. Wirt, we certainly want to thank you for doing another amazing update, especially <laughs> with data that came out this morning. I'm very <laughs> impressed. Uh, you know, that there, there is so much we're learning about COVID uh, hopefully some of this will uh, come bring us some new therapeutic options and a vaccine in the very near future. We sure but, hope so. Yeah, but uh, again, thank you for taking time out with us today. Um, remember the code is in the chat if you uh, need the code. Uh, and finally, I just want to remind everyone next week uh, at noon, uh, for our Pharmacy Fridays, uh, we will have Shay Manigo, who is a member of the class of 2007 and Division Vice President at CVS Health. Again, thank you everyone for joining us. Have a wonderful uh, Pharmacist Month, and we'll see you very soon. Thank you, Dean. Anytime, Wayne. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna end the session so everybody grab the code in the chat box. Thank you, Dr. Wirt. Thank you, Dr. Hall. Thank you, yep. Megan. Megan, thank you. You all have a great day, stay safe. All right, Wayne, that was excellent. I guess you're Mask all- social